And speaking of which, so you, so you had a good time last night at the show? Yeah, we were in uh, Fort Lauderdale, a uh, sold-out show. Uh, loud, loud audience. Uh, great, great night. We've, we've been we've been on a really uh, we've been on a hot streak. <laughs> uh, we've been doing good. That's great, man. Yeah. Well, you just had a birthday right last week, right? In nineteenth. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Awesome. So, uh, so after all these years, you know, do you ever kind of look back and go, you know? It's it's been a it's been a fun ride, you know. What keeps you going after uh, all these years? Oh, I still love it. I still love the play. I love music. I love uh, being on tour. I love uh, most of my my most of my uh, time in my life is is about music, playing my gear, my bass, uh, songwriting, producing things like that. So. I love it. It's uh, I still still pretty much feel like I'm 16. So <laughs> even though I'm very far away from that, that's good, man. Yeah, that that helps. Yeah, wish I did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. So you're you're not the normal uh, bass player, you know. I say normal, you know, but I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I know that a lot of people, you know, play a standard way. You you've always played the bass like it was a guitar or some kind of different instrument and i've always been amazed by your play and how did you decide to play the bass well early on a lot of great bass players were played a lot of notes and they were the most important instrument in many ways yeah. other than the voice and a lot is jamie jamerson yeah. he was all over the place on all the motown songs uh, paul mccartney yeah a little help from my friends the bass is the main melodic instrument in the song uh, a lot of Beatles songs were like that. Uh, and then so a long line of predecessors. So unfortunately, people become this guitar centric mind. Yeah. So any instrument that plays more than a single note, they're playing lead guitar on that instrument. So when a piano player plays Oscar Peterson or uh, some brilliant, uh, great piano player plays, I'll see people uh, uh, that just don't have a broad spectrum of musical understanding to say, wow, it's like he's playing lead guitar on piano. Right. Because their whole life, the only instrument they've ever heard play more than a single note was guitar. Sure. Or they'll see uh, uh, some incredible uh, sax player, Charlie Parker, or, or some uh, iconic, incredible sax player, and see him play the impossible on his instrument and wow, it's almost like he's playing lead guitar <laughs> on saxophone. Right. And it's completely wrong. Right. <laughs> because, uh, unfortunately, most popular music for a whole generation, anytime you heard notes in quick succession uh, uh, emanating from an instrument, your instrument uh, automatic thought was lead guitar. That's lead guitar. Right. It's all lead guitar. So if you play anything on uh, any instrument, a banjo, a violin, a uh, French horn, uh, wow, it's like it's like it's lead guitar. Where in fact, uh, many instruments play all kinds of different ways. Sure. There's many approaches to music on a, a, a huge amount of instruments. And there are many instruments that play uh, melodic lines and play chords and play uh fast uh passages paganini on violin uh, famously some of the most difficult stuff to play uh uh it's so so uh i never really looked at bass as a uh anything other than a musical instrument it right. plays what it plays it has many roles sometimes you play a single note sometimes you play to be with you sometimes you play shy boy yeah. there's all kinds of points in between so I, I always I try to make it a point to emphasize that to people to try to get out of that guitar centric way of thinking, and uh, and as a musician when you move away from the fretboard and guitars and listen to something else, it can be very enlightening. I've learned so much from piano, from string sections, cello, mm -hmm. uh, Bach, keyboard, uh, classical music, uh, saxophone, Eddie Harris, Sonny Rollins, uh, Charlie Parker. Right. Uh, uh, all, all, all these people and, and most bass players I know I just saw an interview with Jocko who was from Fort Lauderdale oh, wow. where we played last night I believe he was at least he lived there right. 
they asked him about what bass players he listens to, and he goes, "I I don't listen to bass players. So I, I listen to music, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I happen to also be a bass player. So, uh, not that I'm comparing myself to the great Jocko Pistorius, <laughs> but uh, in any way, but his point is, I believe, is correct, and I think it's important for uh, all musicians to look beyond the uh, borders and beyond the horizon of what the, what they're currently uh, confronting. And, uh, and and move further. Bass sometimes needs to be a solid, big, giant, whole note, holding everything together and giving you your root note for the chords and the song. Other times, uh, it can be anything. Uh, uh, the intro to, uh, I think it's You're So Vain by Carly Simon. It's a little bass arpeggio yeah. on, yeah. Uh, you know, on, a, on a hit song. Right. To Be With You uh, by Mr. Big was... Uh, a very simple bass line, McCartney influenced. I did a couple of lines in it that were right off Sgt. Pepper's oh, wow. on purpose. Awesome. Uh, but a very simple, uh, all it needs to be, because that's all you need on a song like that. And then again, on Freak Show Excess by uh, Steve Vai, you need you need more. Yeah. You know, yeah. you need more than that. So, so basically, I try to uh, just look at it as a musical instrument and see what we need. In the winery dogs now, uh, we're playing live. And I need to hold that big giant bass line underneath what Richie's doing because there's nobody else in the band making any notes other than the drums. And those aren't melodic notes, they're right. percussive notes. So I had to spell out the way that those chords go and the way that song is with a solid bass line while he does his thing. Right. And that's my that's my job in that particular song in that particular part. And then it varies from time to time. Long winded answer, sorry. Hey, that's hey, it works for me, man. <laughs> Now, but but what's so cool is like you said like with the winery dogs i know that you're you're filling in all that with a bass as opposed to playing with a couple of guitarists so you're filling in and you're playing the grooves and you're playing the fill-ins as opposed to a, a rhythm guitar you know and things like that and i know there's a lot of room to work as opposed to wouldn't you say so yeah in a three-piece band it's always a blast for a bass player well all three of us because we're all doing way more than what a lot of a lot of individual musicians do we got to sing you got to play right. uh you got to spell out the chords there are solos there are melodic lines there's harmonies we all got to sing uh so uh the classic uh three-piece bands grand funk railroad mel shacker on bass was was a really great great yeah. player with yeah. a huge sound and he held the band together completely with a drummer amazing a lot of bands with uh, three-piece musicians and a lead singer are similar the who Right. Led Zeppelin, right. the bass was uh, extremely important in those in those uh, bands, and was uh, and moved around a lot because uh, you only had one other guitar in the studio. You can add all kinds of guitars, right. but you hear those bands live, and it still sound pretty amazing because the bass player was able to keep it together. John Entwistle, Jack Bruce from the Cream, uh, like right. I said, Mel Shacker, uh, 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 Van Halen. Uh, Michael Anthony's bass, oh, yeah. really one of the loudest things in the mix, and uh, really a truly great bass player yes. as well. So uh, that's that's kind of the tradition of it. But like I said, it, there's many roles for many instruments. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm sure that happens a lot. Uh, so so when you're going like say from a Mr. Big to a Winery Dogs, does that you kind of look how do you approach that do you go well now i get to do this you know i, I get to do more of this does it kind of you know make you think about what you like to do more or no how? it's it's more just the song to song yeah. oh, and in a you know in one particular song i'll play i, I do what the baseline was written to be and since i recorded it, it was probably my doing uh <laughs> A uh, green tinted '60s mind, or mm -hmm. or to be with you, or uh, daddy, brother, lover, little boy. Those are all we put those songs together, and the bass is what it is, and that's that's the way it goes. And in the winery dogs with uh, uh, Xanadu or Mad Mad World, our first two uh, videos, and all the other songs on the new record. Um, uh, you know, we just kind of made it up as we go along, and sometimes. Uh, I was in a band for a long, long time and played hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of copy tunes through years. Yeah. And you learn what bass is supposed to do, especially on hit records, because when you're a copy band, you don't play the 
B sides, you play the A side. Right, right. And uh, and uh, so people come out, see the band, and dance, and drink beer, and uh, and the club makes money, and they pay you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was that was the purpose for a long time. But it's a great training to play uh, cover tunes because you're playing songs that are hits, and you're learning wh- why why are they hits? Why are people drawn to them? Why do why do they appeal to people? And you learn what kind of a bass line goes in a hit. And it can be, again, a lot of variations. You hear uh, uh, Want Somebody to Love by Jefferson Airplane. And listen to Jack Cassidy's bass line. It's all over it. the yeah, place. Love it. Brilliant. Yes. It's it's all over. Fantastic. Really great. And a couple other examples that I mentioned earlier, I won't uh, repeat myself. But, yeah. Uh, yeah this, it, 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 music is art. And art can be anything. You can, make a, you can paint a canvas black paint it white or paint uh, the Mona Lisa on there and all points in between. Sure. And, you know, you're talking about Paul McCartney with his play and, you know, I think a lot of the appreciation goes into actually picking up a bass. If somebody would pick up a bass or, or make an attempt to focus on that, they'd be amazed at what is all part of a song, you know, and if they broke it down into that, they'd be like, whoa, that guy can play. You can appreciate somebody better when you actually play that instrument, right? I believe so. And now during the p- pandemic, I couldn't uh, tour. So I uh, sit in the home minding my own business and people would write to me from around the world and want me to play bass on their tracks since everybody was home. Sure. Yeah. And uh, we ended up doing over 600 songs, wow. about four or five complete records. And we would get the songs uh, transferred to us uh, digitally, I'd get the tracks, set them up and listen to what was there without bass. And I would look at my engineer, and he'd look at me and go, oh, what, what in the world is this? <laughs> yeah, right. oh, how are we going to make music out of this? Some were very together, but some <laughs> just didn't really have anything to them that, yeah. that was appealing to us at all. So, okay, let's see what we can do. Right. And I'm not saying that it's my baseline or me. This is not any kind of self-congratulation. <laughs> but it's just bass in general. When added to a song that doesn't have it, suddenly... By the end of, our, of the session, we look at each other like, wow, this is this is working. And it was really very enlightening to see uh, on hundreds, literally, of examples of songs coming in that, uh, well, OK, I guess I see the chord progression and the lyrics kind of make sense. And the drums are what they are. And yeah. you put a bass in there and all of a sudden, ah, it's all glued together now. Sure. It's a song. And uh it was a real interesting thing to observe. So uh, uh, sometimes people will dismiss the bass as a uh, background instrument. And sometimes it is. Yeah. And it's not. But don't dismiss it as a background instrument. Without that background, the foreground doesn't quite stand on its own. And so when you put a, sometimes a rock solid whole notes just following the bass drum patterns, doing the roots of the chords, uh, very simple. Most anyone could do it. Even if you've never played it before, I could probably get you up and running in a couple hours uh, to and, and be able to play it. Uh, but without it, man, there's it's it's hard to really uh, make out that it's a song. It's kind of an interesting thing. That's right. I, I don't think people appreciate it until it's not there. You know, it's like you got to have it. You know, um, exactly. That's why sometimes in an arrangement of a song, bass drops out on purpose, and suddenly you hear this complete shift of everything. Sure. And then the bass comes back in. And, oh man, I get it. It's a it's an interesting uh, way of arranging songs sometimes. Sure. And you know, uh, we're talking about Mr. Big earlier. You know, today is the thirty second anniversary of Lean Into It. Did you know that? I didn't know that today was that anniversary. That's very interesting. I should uh, I better post about that on Facebook. Yeah. I'm get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be like, "Hey, why didn't you?" Yeah. Um. You know, and you were. I know that you've been, uh, you've played with all kinds of people and had, you know, been surrounded by a lot of people. You're a talented guy. Uh, I know you're with Talis. How did you go from Talis to David Lee Roth? How did he get up with you? Well, Talis opened for uh, Van Halen in 1980. We did about 30 shows with them and we stayed in touch. I talked with uh, Eddie several times. Uh, we discussed about possibly uh, me working with him in some capacity, maybe possibly even joining the band, mentioned it to me at least three times. And uh, 
never never happened uh, only because and i'm kind of glad it didn't happen because i love michael anthony yeah. and i love the as much <laughs> as i wanted the van halen gig i think yeah but then it's not van halen anymore yeah, right because as a fan when they change a member uh, so i was torn but we stayed in touch over the years and uh 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 when uh, 1985 came around i just got a call from dave and he was i didn't know but he was going to quit van halen and start a band and called me so i said well, I, I said there's no band I'd ever quit Talos for, except for Van Halen. And I go, David Lee Roth, close enough. And that was it. So I, <laughs> sure. I, I went out and we started that. Uh, that went well. Eat, eat him and smile and skyscraper. Eat him and smile. I love skyscraper. Was not my thing really. So uh, I moved on and started Mr. Big, and lightning struck twice, and we managed to get uh, a, a big hit record with Lean Into It and a <laughs> number one single all around the world, and. Uh, that went on for, for many years. Uh, we stopped playing for a while, reunited again. We're uh, about to go out and do a uh, kind of a farewell tour. Our, sadly, our drummer passed away, and mm-hmm. we wanted to pay tribute to him and also say a proper farewell. So we're going to be doing that over the next uh, year or so. And then in the interim, I did several other projects. Niacin, a band with mm-hmm. Dennis Chambers on drums, just one of the greatest drummers ever, kind of a fusion uh uh, jazz fusion kind of a thing, but high energy. And then uh, the Winery Dogs we started uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, Mike Portnoy and I wanted to do a band. Let's do a trio. You know, a guitar player that sings and uh, Eddie Trunk said, Richie Cotson. I go, ah, of course. <laughs> so Richie and I had worked together a lot. He was briefly in Mr. Big for a while. I also did some shows. We opened up for five uh, Rolling Stones shows in Japan few years ago and we played together and jammed together a lot over the years so we got we all got together started this band i'm that we're i'm on the bus with right now awesome and uh here we are uh third record uh is uh, doing uh, surprisingly well and uh that's that's the story of my uh my that's my trail of breadcrumbs up to this point <laughs> that's good yeah well let me go back a little bit if that's okay um with with Mr. Big though, I know you know you exploded with the song to be with you, and it was everywhere and a number one song, right? But how did you go from you know, you know, if you're known for rocking, you're known for these bigger songs, and 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 you get a song like to be with you. Does that hurt you to pe- to know that people recognize you for like a ballad or a song like that, or do you think, hey, I'm proud of that song? You know, and it is the it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you could ever have a number one single, please do because uh, it is a it's a life changing, world changing. We just passed a hundred million views oh, wow. of "To Be With You" on YouTube. Everywhere we went, all over the world, people knew who we were. If mm-hmm. they didn't, we hummed the first few bars, and then they did know. In Pakistan or India or Singapore or Korea or Thailand or Australia or Ecuador yeah. or Colombia or Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Germany, France, Spain, <laughs> Italy, Greece, Russia, wow. Turkey, everywhere. everywhere. It was everywhere. It was number one in 14 countries. So uh, we often wow. laugh to ourselves when people say, oh, you must have really been bummed out. And it must have been a horrible <laughs> thing that this, yeah, this terrible. little acoustic ballad was a hit <laughs> and your fast, loud songs weren't hits. Well, uh, no, it wasn't. It was fantastic. And we had as many people in the show. Uh, we, we, we broke down a lot of barriers with that song because people would come out to see me and Paul shred on guitar and bass wearing their uh, Metallica or Slayer shirts. And uh, 14-year-old girls with braces would come out to hear to be with you. Sure. And by the end of the night, everybody was uh, had their fists pumping in the air, and everybody was having a great time. And, uh, yeah, we uh, I, I love that song. I still love playing it. I do know some bands that have had acoustic hits that kind of resent them, and I I wish I could sit them down and say, hold on a second. You know that house that you have? You know what paid <laughs> yeah. for it? Send it back. <laughs> the, yeah. the, that, that acoustic ballad. <laughs> yeah, so everybody it. relax. I love that song, and uh, it, it changed my life. And uh, we play it now it. in front of 1,000, 5,000, 10, 20, 50, 75,000 people, and, and you see an ocean of smiles yeah. and some tears of joy from people from that song. 
So never underestimate the power of a hit song. And and uh, and I love the song. We loved it. It's a, the first time we ever heard. That's great. We, uh, it was on a cassette at the end. Like, pay no attention to this song. We heard it. Oh, hold on, hold on. It's like, what what song is that? <laughs> uh, we got to do it. We got to do it. We were all into it. So uh, it was a great, great thing and uh, enriched our lives beyond uh, your wildest imagination. Sure. Well, how did that video come about? Because I know it's like a simple video where you're kind of sitting around kind of jamming and, you know, it, and it just it just works for that song. How did, how did y'all do that? Yeah, we uh, the song started to take off all on its own. Atlantic Records really kind of fought it because they had other artists they were pushing, and this little Mr. Big record is in the way. Right. So they actually would call up radio stations and say, I know, no, you don't, add, don't add the Mr. Big record. Add the Phil Collins record. That's what we're pushing. <laughs> sure. They say, no, we got a lot of phone calls on the Mr. Big, so we're going to add them. So they actually fought it uh, all the way uh, up, and, and then they got into the top 40, top 20, top 10. And we say, hey, we better do a video. <laughs> okay, so what do we do? And uh, Nancy Bennett was our video director. She's quite a quite a spectacular uh, uh, artist in video. And uh, well, we got to, there's this place called Train Town. They got these train cars. This really helps to do a long shot with the camera because it's long, thin room. Let's mm-hmm. go into one of the train cars in Train Town, which is in uh, North Hollywood. And uh, and shoot it. So we just went in, run playback, sing along. That was it. And uh, cheap video didn't cost as much. Mm. It gets up on MTV. Bang, bang, bang. It's number one video. And uh, so uh, it, it was uh, a lot of things just kind of happened around that time. Uh, they took on a life of their own. Uh, we were uh, in the spot to become number one, but our our we had two competitors. Uh, Prince and Michael Jackson were in line for number one. Wow. I forgot what songs they were. Wow. And Mr. Big jumped ahead of him and hit the number one spot. So who'd have thunk it? <laughs> Some little band, awesome. uh, relatively unknown at that time, jumped ahead of the superstars, and we hit. And it was for three weeks at number one, too. Not wasn't just a fluke that went in and out. Wow. So, uh, so the video was just a, kind of an afterthought. And uh, but yet it had a charm to it because it didn't have a lot of thinking put in it, uh, a lot of uh, board meetings about what what the video should show or anything. So we just got in there, did playback, lip synced. There's your video. All good. Awesome. And and I guess the the big thing you're waiting for. Do you remember when Casey Kasem said, "Here's the number one song." You know, and then, yeah. right, <laughs> and you're like, yes, you know, I've made it. The right? number one song in the nation. Right. Mr. Mr. Big. Big with the Be With You. Yeah, pretty amazing. Love His it. daughter is a dear friend of mine. Also. Uh, uh, Carrie Kasem, a wonderful girl. Oh, wow. Man, what those were the days. I, I, I always thought about, you know, when I heard songs like that and I heard Casey say it, I was like, that's, you, you've accomplished your goal in life. You know, the, you, you can, you know, die happy now, you know. Uh, but that's, that's really awesome to, uh, to get to experience that. So now you're, you're going, I guess you're going on tour this summer with Mr. Big. Yeah, we do uh Southeast Asia, Japan this summer, and then the other territories after. So we'll be doing a run in North America, a run in South America, run in Europe, maybe Australia, but we're not sure yet. And then uh, we say our goodbye. And I know it's been, uh, it's been an awesome time being a part of that band. I know it's been rough about your friend and drummer, uh, how, how did you decide to carry on uh, despite uh, his passing? Well, well, we um, a lot of people love the band, and uh, a lot of people want to see us play. Uh, everything I have, my home, my car, everything I own comes from somebody buying a T-shirt, a ticket, or a record. Yeah. And I don't forget about that ever. And uh, just a lot of people were really missing the band, loved the band, wanted to see us play. We did some shows without our drummer uh, after he had passed away and uh, because we had uh, contractual obligations to do them. And uh, it was good, but it was just, just didn't seem right. So we needed some time. Yeah. So we just stopped. And uh, so now we're going to go back and uh, maybe just do a run to in his uh, honor. Uh, say goodbye to the fans for one last time as Mr. Big uh, and uh, 
that's that's basically the story. You know, we've, uh, enough time has passed now sure. since past passing that we're we're good. We're good. good. We, we we feel we can go out and and play again and have it not be a uh, yeah. emotionally difficult time because he was uh, we, were, we were very close on that band sure. and uh, and for me personally, Pat was my closest musical mm. uh, partner. You know, in in, in all those days. So, uh, but but we're good now. That's you know, good. time time heals all wounds, and we're going to go out and pay tribute to Pat and say farewell to our incredible fans. Awesome. Um, and earlier you were talking about, uh, Eddie Trunk. And I, I remember though, the, the, uh, you were with, I think winery dogs on there on the, that metal show. Did, have they ever thought about getting that show back on? Cause I was thinking about that. I'm thinking that would be perfect for this time. There needs to be more of that, you know, more. Oh yeah. So well, is that, well, uh, I know Eddie's still trying. Uh, it's a television is a whole other world beyond the music biz. Yeah. And it's, if you think the music biz is complicated, te- television <laughs> is 10 times more complicated. Movies are 10 times more complicated than that. So it's a tough uh, hill to climb, but I know Eddie would love to. His podcasts are amazing, super yes. popular. Sure. He introduced our, uh, our last couple of shows around my birthday. It was wonderful to have him out. He's really been such a, 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 a asset to all musicians and all uh, bands because he really helping keep the scene alive and helping it grow and helping it helping new bands and uh, older bands uh, helping people hear their new stuff he's uh, just such a great great asset to the music biz as I see it and uh, hopefully he'll get back on the air again that'll be awesome um, well you've reached a milestone with your last birthday what this past week so what are your plans from here on out? Is there something major that you think and you want to accomplish that you haven't accomplished before? Just play, play more and play more places. I, uh, every show is, a, is an accomplishment. We, uh, I warm up all day, get up on that stage, do everything I can, but, uh, uh pour it out of me <laughs> until I'm empty. <laughs> and, uh, hopefully the crowd uh, will respond accordingly. And we're very, very grateful that, on this run, especially, we've had sold-out shows everywhere, and wow. it's been uh, an incredible uh, thing to be back in front of an audience. I couldn't play for three years. And I am supremely grateful for anybody that comes out to a show. So every show is like a, a milestone at this point, and I'm, I'm just so glad to get up there and play. And uh, I will continue to do so until uh maybe even when there's a tube in me and i'm in a wheelchair i'll continue to play <laughs> right because well, i there you go. I, I really don't ever want to stop i right. want to keep going for uh, as long as i'm able to uh, take a breath hey that's that's a great way to look at it right um are there any uh people that you haven't worked with that you'd like to work with or do some kind of project with in the future i've been really lucky to play with most everybody i i've uh, i've looked at with uh, admiration uh sure. i played with that i was the only guy that played with every member of van halen uh, uh and uh played with uh some amazing drummers through the years uh vinny Caliuta, mm-hmm. dennis chambers uh virgil donati greg bissonette mike portnoy pat torpy of course uh did some great jams with a lot of great bass players as well and a lot of amazing guitar players uh, Steve Vai, Richie Cotson, Paul Gilbert, Tony McAlpine, uh, a lot of guys. So uh, I, I had the inclination to play with Paco de Lucia for a long time, but sadly we lost him. Mm. He's a flamenco artist. But uh, at this point, I can't think of anyone offhand, but I'm very lucky to have played with so many that uh, really, uh, really wonderful, incredible people and uh, mind blowing artists. Well, you know, I was thinking about uh, I know that Herbie Herbert managed the band. Do you have a. a... A memory of him. I know he's he's uh, was with uh, Journey, and I'm a big Journey buff. You know. Yeah, but... he basically created Journey. Right. He put that together and found Steve Perry and brought him in, and he was the guy who said, "Why don't we sell T-shirts at the show with the band's name on them?" Right. And thus, uh, merchandising was born, which is a billion dollar industry sure. now, and how most bands make their money now. Sure. He was one of the founding fathers of the music biz. He was uh, uh, he was why Mr. Big had a hit single. Wow. 
and and he he was a, a a truly truly great man and instrumental in my success and Mr. Big's success, Journey's success, uh, and so many other things. He was just a had a heart of gold. He was an honest as the day is long and just a wonderful wonderful man. And uh, I wouldn't be where I am today without him. Awesome. Well, you know that. At least, you know, you're humble in that. It's kind of like your, you know, approach to the base when you look at it and you go, you know, you you appreciate it more. When you appreciate other people more, I think they appreciate you more because they're seeing that in in you, you know, when you're you're talented, but yet you see other people, you know, doing their thing. Yeah, because we're all in this together. And uh, the amount of people and effort and energy and scheming and uh, uh, conspiracy it takes (laughs) to get a number one single is uh, mind blowing. When you're in the top 100, you're in shark infested waters. When you get to the top 40, those sharks get bigger and hungry. In the top 10, man, they're all great whites and they ha- they haven't eaten for a week. So uh, Herbie pulled it off. He did it. He got us to awesome. number one uh, uh, single handedly to a large degree. So uh, it was quite amazing. And uh, he's done it with so many artists. He's also found artists that were in great bands in the past that were not doing well. One particular guy, I think from Moby Grape was the band and found him and got him, got him a place to live and cleaned him up and helped him out, you know, because he was a fan of the band and helped so many artists in so many ways. And all of his artists he worked with, he took an, uh, an interest in their financial well-being and helping them and seeing that they made the right decisions. And what a incredible, incredible man. I'm uh, just uh, so lucky to have known him. And again, uh, the, the team he put around us, our producer, Kevin Elson, was the guy who produced the Journey sure, stuff, sure. came in with Mr. Big and just did a spectacular job. And uh, again, part of the team and part of you know the dozens of people that it takes to make something happen in any business. But in the music biz, it's a uh, it's a uh, the talents are, are quite, uh, quite magnificent. And and you look back, uh, you know, looking at times like that and understanding, I'm sure you do, of course, that those times won't happen again because there's, it's there's not that, you know, same atmosphere out there, right? And then there's not the same environment as far as the recording industry and things like that. So to get a number one now, yeah, it's a different right? world now. Yeah, it's a different world. We're not going to see uh, people say, "Oh, we're waiting for the next Beatles." It's not going to be another Beatles. No. We don't have we don't have the uh, population curve of the baby boomers that we had when the Beatles were there. Right. Just the uh, uh, logistics of it probably won't happen again. But something else will happen. Yeah. Playing all over the big crowds. We're playing festivals in Europe. We'll play all over Europe, like I said. Uh, so in South America, it's a hot, uh, exciting scene for rock music. At the shows, the kids sing the solos of the songs oh, wow. it's just uh, amazing and uh so it's it's good and it's alive you don't see it because there's no mtv talking about it anymore but man it's it's uh out here we're we're doing great and a lot of bands are it's an exciting cool scene yeah uh, and it's easy for anybody to get a laptop and start writing songs and making them sound amazing uh, uh, a home studio uh is better than most uh, multi-million dollar studios, studios from the seventies or eighties. It's a, so it's a, it's a good time for music. I, I'm, I'm enthusiastic about it. And I think, uh, there's, it's, it's all over the map as far as genre. There's all kinds of bands that play all kinds of music of all kinds of styles and all kinds of artists that play and write and all, all every imaginable, uh, style you, uh, there is. Uh, but, but that's good. Look at as if you're a music fan, man, you got, there's so much to choose from, from these days. And sure. uh, it's a great time. And, uh, one more question before I let you go. I, I was, I was th- wondering about your take on, uh, like the rock and roll hall of fame. How do you look at that as a whole, as, as far as they, you know, getting people in there that should be in there and some that maybe shouldn't be in there. What's your take on all that? I, I know nothing about it. You know, this is why the, we're split up into so many things now these days. There isn't just a one one chart or one uh, a, a rock and roll isn't isn't just the only kind of music. There's all kinds of music. Uh, so it's hard for 
uh, something like that to exist anymore because you, uh, you know, they're going to bring uh, Dolly Parton. What a great artist. Sure, uh, what sure. an incredible uh, icon. I don't know if you would classify her as rock and roll. And I think even she was kind of taken back to be uh, that. <laughs> and there's so many uh, hip hop and R&B rules the airways, rules the dance floor now. I don't see any of them going. Uh, if you want to call it the Music Hall of Fame, might be a better idea mm -hmm. to do that these days than rock and roll. But uh, who knows? But I don't follow too much of what they do or why they do it. So, uh, uh, I, you know, we have our we got Eddie Trunk and our fans and we're, we're happy. <laughs> That's all you need. <laughs> That's all you need. Well, that's right. good. Well, I appreciate you talking to me, and uh, I'm, I've all, I've been a fan for years, and all your stuff, and I and I do I play instruments and stuff, so I, you inspire me. So let me just say that. I'm glad so, to hear. I'm glad to hear. And uh, I thank you so much for talking to me today. All right, you take care, and uh, I'll see you out and about somewhere. I hope. All right, man. Take care. All right. All right. Thanks bye. a lot. All right. Bye bye.